What's up, everybody? This is your boy Uber Hikari, aka the Nerd Nigga, here to bring you another video with no frills, just the analysis. And today I'm here to bring you the episode 2 review of Attack on Titan entitled That Day, subtitled The Fall of Shiganshina Part 2. First, some basic things I have to get out of the way. These reviews should be out on Saturday night rather than Sunday night. Well, kind of like Monday morning now, but you get the idea. So I've pretty much been off schedule for these first two episodes because I haven't been able to find the episode in a timely enough manner. And that's why they've been coming out Sunday night as opposed to Saturday night. But now that I'm getting my schedule in order, these episode reviews should be out Saturday night. Also, some information I found out is that this series is apparently going to be 25 episodes long, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the manga is going to be ongoing, so I don't know how they're going to resolve that issue once the anime catches up to the manga, because it almost certainly will, given the fact that the manga comes out monthly. But they could also just have a 25-episode series and the anime could just develop its own ending. But in any event, it's pretty clear that they're, they're following the manga. And if they follow the manga closely and just put on their own ending at the end of the 25 episodes, I can pretty much guarantee you that this is going to be one of the most action-packed series, especially shonen series, you've ever seen. Because this, this is ridiculously action-packed in the manga and like I said if they're following the manga closely then you should be ready for a lot of blood a lot of guts a lot of gore and a lot of freaking action and plot twists I mean so I can guarantee you that if they follow the manga also some other basic information Crunchyroll is now streaming Attack on Titan in 1080p on Sundays it's 1080p HD HD, because you know I'm Uber Hikari. I don't, I don't mess around with that standard definition. It's all HD. So if you want to support the series, you want to support Crunchyroll, don't download this from a fan sub site. Go to Crunchyroll and watch it. So I, I think that that would be good for the series and also, of course, for the creator of the series, Hajime Isayama. Now, with that being said, let's get into this review. Now, the first episode was already a hell of an episode. It was already, especially the last five minutes, it was already a hell of an episode. And it's like the creators of this series said, you're back for more? You're back for more? Episode two, if you thought episode one was, was brutal and action-packed, episode two... This was just a, a crazy episode, man. I mean, the, the anime is epic. Epic with a capital E. Just absolutely epic. Now, let me... Before I, I, I get specifically into this episode, I gotta, I gotta address this animation one more time, man. Because the more I watch this show, the more I see that I'm loving this animation. This is a clear case where the anime will be superior to the manga. That's just my my prediction right off the bat. The animation will definitely be superior to the manga. The, the, the backgrounds have so much depth and detail. You can clearly see how densely populated this, this district is, this village is. And they really show, the one thing I really like about the animation as well is how they show the topography and the landscape. So the mountains and the hills and the forests and the, the bodies of water, because like I said, Isayama is not that good of a good of a uh, an artist so he doesn't even show that much in the manga but in the animation smooth smooth man real smooth and also last time I said that there wasn't CGI in this animation but somebody in the comment section pointed out that there actually is CGI but it's so smooth because I, I did notice that there were some CGI shots in this episode that's how you know the animation and the production quality is top notch because the CGI is so smooth, you barely notice it. You, I mean, you you really have to be paying attention. So if I wasn't reviewing this and I wasn't paying attention, I probably would would not have noticed the CGI. Now, 
the Titan invasion in episode two. The continuation of this Titan invasion. Honestly, I thought that they were off screen the rest of this invasion and that this would there would be a time skip between episode one and episode two. No. No. We pick up pretty much right where we left off. And the writers and directors are clearly not shying away from the brutality of this series. I mean, this shit is brutal. Brutal and chaotic. And they're able to capture the mood and the tone of that brutality perfectly. You, It starts off with crows eating dead bodies. And then we there's this, this voiceover of this religious fanatic who's reading these scriptures. And he's just out of his freaking mind. Which just adds just another layer of craziness and chaos to this whole entire scene. This, this guy walking around in the middle of a Titan invasion where everybody's being slaughtered and eaten. And this guy is reading a book of scripture. Another scene, a woman running away from a Titan, running into an a, a alley with a dead end. Titan just reaches down, grabs her by her head, and lifts her up off the ground. Crazy brutal. Crazy brutal. And it's not just brutal because of the Titans. There's an extra layer here. There's another dimension here, ladies and gentlemen. It's brutal because of how we learn, of not how, but what we learn. Well, how and what we learn, actually, about the structure of society and the attack on Titan world. And this, this episode really gives us some very deep insight into how the humans treat other humans in this world. We learn that the society and the attack on Titan world is basically a class-based society. It's segregated by class. Some societies are segregated by religion. Some are segregated by race. This society is clearly segregated by class and to a certain extent nobility because they have a monarchy they have a their political system is a is a is a kingdom they have a king as their figurehead so we learn last episode we learned that there was wall maria wall rose and then wall sheena in concentric circles in this episode we realized that wall Sh maria the outermost wall is basically where the, the dregs of society live. It's where the lower class people live. And we also learned that the, they structured the towns so that they would be bait for titans. How, how freaking sick is that, man? They built the walls and they built the towns so that some of the towns on, on, on the outer wall of Wall Maria so that they would be bait for titans in order to decrease military spending and defense spending. They basically used humans as fish bait because their idea is if, if we use these towns to attract all the titans, then they'll focus on these towns and they won't focus on the, the other parts of the wall. And therefore... We don't have to defend those other parts of the wall because the Titans will all gravitate to the towns if we use the towns as bait. That's sick. I mean, that's, that's really, really sick. Then we find out that Wall Rose is pretty much where the, the middle class basically lives. That's, that's where they live. And we learned that Wall Sheena is where the king lives and where the government resides. And the government is flat out corrupt. We learned that right off the bat in this episode. They're flat out corrupt. I mean, the, the way these people were being packed on, on those ships, the classism clearly comes through in this episode. And one of the, like I said, one of the most gut-wrenching parts of this episode was seeing how they crammed those people on the ships, even to the point of telling them, don't bring any luggage because we can't we can't afford to bring any luggage. You can't carry any luggage. If we don't have luggage, maybe we can fit more people on the ship. And the ships weren't even big enough to get all the people out of the the Shiganshana district. Only had a capacity of 500 people. That's all. And on top of that, they wouldn't even take the kids on the ship. 
There were some parents holding up their babies. They weren't allowed, even, all of them weren't even allowed to get on the ship. And then we see that they had just absolutely inadequate resources. Those, those cannons they had, they weren't doing shit. Nothing. Army didn't even have adequate equipment. They're trying to fight trying to fight the Titans with cannons. And one of the guys is like, what are we supposed to do with these cannons? We can't hit moving targets. Pure brutality and chaos. And then they were going to close the gates and lock everybody in the town to be eaten by the Titans. <sighs> like I said, that is just absolutely sick. And then the people who were, who, if you were lucky enough to get on the boat, you're lucky enough to get on the ship and make it inside of a wall rose. The people who were from the from Wall Maria were segregated from the people inside of Wall Rose. In fact, they were characterized as refugees. And my thinking was, how the hell could you be a refugee inside your own country? You can't be a refugee inside your own country. I mean, that's how deep the classism and the divisions inside the attack on attack on Titan societies work. To the point where people from who are from other walls are referred to as refugees. And then, so if you were lucky enough to get on the ship, when you get to Wall Rose, you'll be segregated. You'll be segregated. There'll be some classism against you. And on top of that, you might starve to death. So there's a there's an interesting duality to this this episode because on one hand you had the Titans eating people, devouring people, killing people, slaughtering people. Then on the other hand you had humans who just didn't give a shit about other humans, didn't care if they lived, didn't care if they died, left them to starve. Wasn't even enough food for the people who came from Wall Maria. And in fact. One of the soldiers who was a soldier, and that's, an, that's another thing, each wall has their own military. So the, the, so the, the, the military of Wall Rose, they were like, shit, man, we don't want these people here. We should have let the Titans eat more of them. At least that way we could have saved some, some food. And we find out that basically... 10,000 people were killed in the initial Titan invasion, and then 250,000 were able to escape from Wall Maria into Wall Rose, but they died too, and was sick and just downright, downright wretched about that situation, is that the 250,000 people, they were sent on a supposed campaign or mission to retrieve Wall Maria. But basically, we, we, it's heavily implied that that was a lie. That they weren't sent there on a mission to try to take back Wall Maria from the Titans. What happened was there was a food shortage and they couldn't feed all those people. So rather than have them starve to death, they basically sent them to their deaths to be killed by Titans. They basically wanted those people to be killed by the Titans so they didn't have to feed them. I mean, the Attack on Titan world is really fucked up. Really fucked up. Not just because of the Titans, but because of the humans. So basically, there's three things you need to take away from this. Number one, humanity is not united against the Titans. That's the, that's the one thing that was absolutely made clear in this episode. Humanity is not united against these Titans. There's classism which leads to inadequate planning, no proper resources, oppression, corruption, the fact that humans will use other humans as bait and essentially scapegoats. Second thing you need to take away from this episode, humanity is extremely complacent. 
they've been inside those walls for a hundred years. And it just seems like number one, they didn't really expect the Titans to be able to attack them inside the walls. And number two, they were content with being livestock, or at least some humans were content to use other humans as livestock. And I, I'm, my guess is that the people who were inside of Wall Maria were so used to being treated that way that they just became content with their fate as livestock. Because that's essentially what they were used as. And you can tell that when people get to a point where they're complacent and they're okay with being used as fish bait, that these people are not thinking about hope for the future. They're, they're not in a frame of mind where they can envision a future where there will be no Titans or where humanity wins the war against the Titans because they're so complacent. And we saw this in the last episode as well, where people were didn't want the military to, to go outside on scouting missions or reconnaissance missions, and they didn't want anybody to go outside the walls. They just wanted to be inside the walls. But like Aaron said, these walls don't keep people safe. They keep them in a cage like animals. And the third thing you should take away from this episode is the incredible irony of the situation. Because there's some, there's some seriously dark irony in this situation. Titans treat humans like animals. On one hand, you have Titans treating humans like animals that they can just eat and devour and slaughter at will. And on the other hand, you have humans treating other humans like Titans. In a sense, I'm... In, in a sense, not like titans, like animals. So in a sense, some humans are more like titans than they are like humans. That's incredibly ironic. If, if humans are supposed, I mean, we have this sense that humans are supposed to be united together. They're, sub they're supposed to have each other's backs. But it's not like that at all. Humans are using other humans as as animals to feed the titans so you have a situation where the government and the society is structured in such a way that humans that it makes it possible for humans to act more like titans than humans that's just that's a deep dark irony of this of this situation and i think that Aaron recognizes this inequality subconsciously, but he, he, it's his judgment is clouded by his pathological obsession with Titans. So he understands the inequality of the situation and he understands the, the horror of the fact that humans are being complacent. But he's not worried about the human problems. He's worried about the Titans because he's he's pathologically obsessed with them. And who can blame him? He watched his mother be slaughtered and eaten by Titans right in front of his face. I mean, so in reality, Aaron shouldn't just be mad at the Titans. He should also be mad at the government and society and humans for allowing other humans to be treated this way. And I'll say this right now. There are pretty much two villains in this show. They are the Titans, and then there are some humans. Because some humans are just as bad as Titans. They are, they are, the villains in this show are twofold. Now let me talk about an interesting situation involving Eren's characterization, especially with respect to his interaction with Hannes. So we already know that the crux of this show is about Titan versus human interaction, specifically conflict. But one thing that I really like about this show is how they're depicting the human versus human interaction. And I've already talked about that a lot with the segregation and the classism and the government corruption. But another great example of human versus human interaction is between Aaron and Hannes. That was, that was, that was psychologically, from a psychological standpoint. Because when you see Titans eat humans, that's visceral. That's, that's horror. But the, the psychological element of the show was revealed, or the psychological horror of the show was revealed 
in the sort of interaction between Hannes and Aaron. So Hannes is running away with Aaron, and he finally puts Aaron down, and he says to Aaron, you couldn't protect your mother because you were weak. And when he first said this, I was thinking to myself, hold, did he really just say that to a kid? That's an incredibly harsh thing to say to a child who just saw his mother get eaten by monsters. That's, that's really harsh. And in a way, Hannes was saying to Aaron, you're partially responsible for your mother's death. Because if you were strong, you could have saved her. That's, that's kind of grimy to say to a kid. That's, that's just grimy. But then right after that, Hannes said, I couldn't face the Titan because I was scared. And then you realize the psychological horror of the situation. What we... What Hannes was essentially doing when he tells Aaron that you couldn't save your mother because you were weak is a psychological tactic known as projection. Projection is when you take qualities about yourself that you despise or you loathe or you don't like and you project them onto other people and attack them for having those qualities. When in reality, they just symbolically represent the things about yourself that you don't like. So, really, when Hannes was saying, you, you couldn't protect your mother because you were weak, what he's really saying is, I couldn't protect you and your mother because I was weak. Because Hannes flat out says, I, I, I couldn't protect your mother because I was scared of that titan. I couldn't face the titan. So, that gives you some insight into the psychological pressure that these characters are under when they're reduced to such a level where they have to blame children for their own inadequacies. And not just their inadequacies, inadequacies their helplessness. Because it's not even a question of humans being inadequate. It's just that they just don't have the power to fight back. They're just helpless. Helpless and hopeless. So, I mean, we, we got some real insight into the characters, the structure of society, and real human versus human interaction in this episode. So this episode was just awesome in, in that regard, and also with respect to the characterization of Hannes and Aaron. So this episode was just spot on. A couple of things I want to say in closing for clarification purposes. For those of you who haven't realized yet, there are different types of titans. And this episode alluded to that. The first type of titans are the regular titans. These are titans who are generally 3 to 15 meters tall. These are the titans that run around, eat people, slaughter people. They just seem like they're, they're mindless zombies. Then there are special titans. And these Titans have very, very, very distinct attributes. And we've been introduced to two of those special Titans already. One is the 50 meter Titan. That's the really, 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 really big Titan. The one that was able to see over the wall. And the one you saw in the first episode that kicked the wall in to let all the, the regular Titans in. And if you notice, that's the only Titan that has that smoke. That's that, that emits all of that smoke. So that's one of the special titans. The other special titan is the one we saw in this episode, that was introduced in this episode. That's the armored titan. That's the titan they were shooting those cannonballs at, and it didn't do shit to him. That's why he's the armored titan. <laughs> that's the titan who blew uh, the hole through that gate, through that wall, into the next district. And I'm going to give you some hints. I'm not going to have any spoilers, but I'm going to give you some hints. Keep your eyes on those special titans. That's all I'm going to say for now. Keep your eyes on those special titans. Also, I told you in episode one the father was fishy. And this episode very quickly confirmed that. Father, definitely fishy. Aaron's father was definitely fishy. Aaron... 
said that his father was acting weird ever since he came back. His father gave him the key, told him about the basement, told him he had to go back to the basement. And in this episode, we see him inject Aaron with something. I'm not going to say anything. I'll let you guys speculate about what Aaron's father injected him with, injected him with. Also, something of a of a bonus <laughs> for the people who have read the manga. Just going to ask you this question, no spoilers. Who was able to notice Annie in this episode? That's that's the bonus question. Who was able to see and spot Annie in this episode? That's all I'm going to say about Annie. But yeah, this was another great episode. Definitely can't wait for next week's episode because shit is about to go down. Aaron's about to join the army. Mikasa's about to join the army. Armin is going to join the army. And shit is about to hit the fan. It's going to... I'm I'm not even going to say nothing. I'm just so excited. I'm not even going to say nothing. This shit's going to be crazy. I'm just telling you that much. All right, so this was your boy Uber Hikari, a.k.a. the Nerd Nigga. Just brought you another video with no frills, just the analysis. Peace and have a blessed day.